All right. So should I start or? Yeah, uh, I think you're in the best position to give uh, an introduction of yourself. But of course, again, everyone, welcome to the first edition of um, Science Spotlights. Uh, we, th we really appreciate everyone being here. And thank you so much, Tai Sukman, for joining us today. And we're looking forward to your presentation. OK, so thank you for your invitation. And I'm super honored to be here. And you know, my name is Tesok Moon. Uh, today, I'm representing EBRC, that is the Engineering Biology Research Consortium. And that is basically a nonprofit organization to provide vision and you know, insight to entire global you know, community mostly in a synthetic biology or engineering biology community. And, but we also target, you know, government, including US government, White House, and all the US funding agency. And also, I'm also start to chair one seminar series called SIMBIS, Synthetic Biology Young Speaker Series since 2021 summer with many big names and mostly also young speakers to nurture and feature those young rising stars. So uh, I just asked to give very brief overview of my research and I probably spend five to 10 minutes, but you are welcome to stop me anytime if you are you know, not clear with something I mentioned and I'm happy to have more conversation, not just monologue uh, or lecture. Okay, that's kind of plan. Just, just stop me anytime. Okay, so let me start with my dream. My dream is engineering biology. Our ancestors dream of flying in the sky, but instead of creating birds or transforming themselves into birds, they analyze birds, of course, and design wings and propellers and assemble them together to make airplanes. I want to take the exactly same approach. Instead of creating completely new cells, I analyze existing cell, design so-called synthetic DNA, and assemble them together to make engineered cell that can be used for biochemical generation, biomaterial production, and even for some other application like medical or environmental applications. We call it synthetic biology. Of course, we have many global problems at this moment, including diseases like malaria, diabetes, cancer, and Alzheimer's with many decades of investment, huge money investment and time investment in those area last several decades, we still have yet to conquer these diseases. Environmental pollution is also not a new issue. This is a you know, you know, several decades old problem and climate crisis and plastic pollutions are becoming even worse at this moment. At the same time, with biotechnological advances, we should address biosafety issues like bio waste and pathogen like smallpox. Let me ask a question to everybody. As I mentioned earlier, we spent tons of money for many decades we still have the tons of problems we need to solve. And why is that? My perspective on that issue is last several decades, our research, science and engineering, sort of the environment sort of encourage more incremental research. In that way, they gain short term return rather than breakthrough scientists, science, you know, advance or disruptive technology development. That is unfortunate, especially academic environment, I would say. And 
after I realizing those kind of trend, and then also recently addressed or discussed in one of the you know high profile journal. And a few years ago, I start to think about what kind of crazy idea I could generate. And, and then I somehow luckily got 12 grant. That is all, I would say, crazy idea. And that is actually shown in this slide. And I have the, in fact, almost 10 different agencies covering microbiota engineering, probiotic engineering, all the way to plastic upcycling and biocontainment, and even biomineralization to extract using bacteria, some layer or matter that is necessary for computer and phone making, and also some combination of mathematics and biology and integration, two things together to solve some problem. And the last one I love it, that is basically sending potentially bacteria to the moon. And then my next vacation potentially next year in the moon. So that is kind of something and I happy to answer any question you may have later on, you know, but you could ask right now and I'm happy to answer each detailed kind of description if you are interested. And as I'm currently looking for 12 postdoctoral position candidate, and because I need to implement this project by young people's help. So if you are interested, just send me email and, and then I'm happy to you know discuss more. Okay, so let me give my history of my career. And this is the, the first proposal I written and then the first grant I got. So I was so lucky because I tried one proposal and I submit to Bill Gates Foundation and then I got the money and then that was the amazing thing to me. But another thing I want to highlight here, you probably, I'm not sure you could see the, the face of Bill Gates, but that is actually Facebook, I believe, kind of announcement. And Bill Gates wrote about me. Out of 60 grantees, and then they, he picked four of them, and then I was one of them, one of the four. And then he even put my, picture I made using, of course, Microsoft PowerPoint. I didn't use any other picture from internet, but at the time, Microsoft PowerPoint provides some interesting shape like yogurt and so on. And I used that one. And then I made that one. And then he also put that picture in the Facebook. What an honor, right? But unfortunately, I am not you know, Facebook account holder, still I don't have any account in that one. So I didn't know about that until my friend actually told me, oh, Tessa, do you know Phil Gates? Of course I do know him. No, 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 do you know him in person? How can I know him? And that's my answer, but, but why he put your name and your picture over there? So and then, and then I found out afterward. But that actually triggered my interest in probiotic engineering. And then we recently published one paper that is all about using probiotic, that probiotic basically detecting neurochemical in your gut. You may wonder, did Dr. Moon just said neurochemical in the gut? Yes, I'm talking about neurochemical in the gut. Let me ask a question to everybody. How many people heard about neurochemical found in your gut? Please raise your hand if you have heard about that. Oh, I see some. Okay, great. Any other? Okay, I see some. Okay, that's fantastic. You, you kind of 
interest. This is my first seminar I given. Have many people talking about. I heard about neurochemical in the gut. I said, you're amazing. If I give that same seminar, 100 people, I typically just see hands like three to four hands out of 100 people. In fact, neurochemical found in the gut, and that is actually discovered many years ago. And one another thing I want to tell you is one of the neurochemical called serotonin, that is actually produced by gut cell. And the, the total percentage is basically more than 90% of serotonin that is produced by gut cell. So you may wonder, is it true? And brain doesn't make the serotonin and absolutely that's correct. And then I'm talking about more than 90%. Why that is important to me? When I learned about this fact, I was so excited because now I realized I could measure the concentration of neurochemical in the gut using probiotic that is orally administrated. And then probiotic just hang out in the gut and then use so-called biosensor they have they can basically detect neurochemical. And that's important because probiotic in the yogurt basically now have ability to detect some disease because of unbalanced level of the neurochemical in your gut that kind of systemic medically kind of affect entire body. So you may hear, hear about gut feeling and that is actually true because now scientists even found neurochemical in the gut metabolized by the bacteria in your gut. Also bacteria also produce neurochemical in your gut. And going back to the serotonin story, serotonin is very important neurochemical as you know, that basically control our mood and happiness. And then what I wanted to do in the future is you drink my yogurt, I potentially develop, probably not tomorrow, but five years later. And then I'm sorry, I'm talking about poop, depending on which region you are, you probably just finish your breakfast or going to eat your lunch, but I'm talking about poop. But my goal is my probiotic bacteria sense those neurochemicals, including serotonin. And then these bacteria produce some pigment or fluorescence. And then you just see your poop and then today's poop color is green. That means your serotonin level is 100. And that means your serotonin level is good enough. And then today is a happy day, okay? Unfortunately, tomorrow your serotonin level decrease below 20 and then your poop color become red, that means today's bad day because you are not happy, okay? That is the thing. But why we stop there? So as I said earlier, bacteria even metabolize or produce neurochemical. If you connect that sensor, and then instead of using pigment producing enzyme or fluorescence protein protein and the product percent fluorescence pro producing protein, GFP or others, you could connect sensor with enzyme that produce or decrease or degrade the neurochemical. In that way, serotonin level should be a certain range too high, too low is bad. If serotonin level is too high, you could ask bacteria produce enzyme that degrade serotonin, and then your serotonin level become lower. If level is too low, your bacteria start to produce, and then your serotonin level will be always a certain level. And then my advertisement 
probably not tomorrow, but five years later or 10 years later, if everything's so slow, I would say, do you want to be happy all the time? Take my yogurt and you will be happy all the time. So that's my dream. Of course, crazy dream that takes many years of effort and many challenges to overcome, but that is one thing I wanted to passionate and I wanted to achieve. But you may say, Dr. Moon, you're talking about engineering probiotic, that probiotic is live cell, and that will become out of our body once they detect or curing any disease. Yes, you are completely right. I'm talking about notorious GMOs, and then GMO will be released into the environment. So we started a project called biocontainment project that basically allow, allow is not the right word, force bacteria self-destruct once their mission, here their mission could be cleaning up environment or curing disease in the gut, once their mission is accomplished, they start to self-destruct. In that way, there is no harm to the environment. So to do so, we developed kill switch, and then that actually demonstrated in mouse model. And we are currently using the same concept for some other bacteria, that bacteria eating plastic. In that way, once they eat all the plastic in the environment, that means clean up our environment from plastic pollution, and then they self-destruct. You also probably also heard about algae bloom and so on, because many people even also think about GMO for a synthetic bacteria deploy in the environment producing biofuels, but sometimes uncontrollable growth may destroy ecosystem. But we could add some specific chemical to kill those GMOs if that happened without touching other native bacteria or organism in the system, because that is the targeted killing uh, using some kill switch you know, we implemented. So basically, you know, what I envision in the more sustainability or ecosystem side, I thinking about one idea for 10 years and finally had courage to put that crazy idea in the paper recently published. Now I see soil or even entire planet. I just use soil as an example, but it could be water, but entire planet. Now I see that entire planet as a huge bioreactor that basically capture carbon dioxide, of course, using photosynthetic bacteria that could be engineered or native photosynthetic bacteria. In that way, you could imagine reducing greenhouse gases and then even provide some nutrient like fixed nitrogen using some nitrogen fixing bacteria. In that way, you don't need to worry about adding nitrogen fertilizer. In that way, you also prevent some pollution due to added chemical nitrogen fertilizer. And then you could also add some probiotic bacteria. Here, probiotic means probiotic or helpful for the planet health. And that probiotic bacteria could eat plastic waste or any other toxic chemical in the soil, and then even convert that into high value chemical or materials. And that is something I envision and I believe that type of research should be done in the future next two decades or three decades. To do so, we actually develop some tools that could engineer bacteria in situ 
I'm talking about soil or gut. And then the, our tool basically enable us to kill only one bacterium in theory out of billion different bacteria. Basically what we use is machine learning algorithm that design some guide RNA, that guide RNA basically working only one bacterium. In that way you could kill, for example, a pathogen that infect plants or crops. In that way, you basically remove one guy out of this microbiota. At the same time, we could use the same thing, but killing all other guys, if you wanted to isolate from the soil sample, only one guy, that one guy is very useful by generating some useful chemical or fixing nitrogen or fixed carbon, something like that. So we demonstrate that using some synthetic consortium, using four member system. And then actually we demonstrate twice to kind of show generalizability of that concept. Also, we also use the plastic utilizing bacteria to produce chemical. In this case, the lycopene and we chose lycopene because lycopene is very expensive chemical up to several thousand hundred dollars per kilogram and pt you know one of the plastic we currently working or so we also working on other plastic including polyethylene or polypropylene and polystyrene and so on we wanted to convert that into high value chemical or material. And then PT, for example, only $1 per kilogram. And then we are talking about several thousand dollar per kilogram product. And especially lycopene is very important for me because current practice of making lycopene is basically using extraction method from the food, like tomato for lycopene or carrot for beta carotene. And I believe that is the horrible idea because we touching food or play with food at the same time, many people in developing country like Africa currently dying because they don't have food. So my goal is by using this new technology, make the cost down significantly. In that way, compound cost will be down and then basically disrupt the industry. In that way, nobody will bother to extract those chemicals from the food. In that way, I solve the problem of food inequality at the same time, plastic pollution problem. So with that, you know, I want to acknowledge you know, many people. Without them, you know, I cannot do those kind of amazing technology development. Development, of course, the all young people in my lab and funding agency, my collaborator, and also my two advisor, Chris Taller and Chris Boy. And also, I'm happy to answer any other question. And thank you for your attention. And I'm a bit say too much now i see 20 minutes left but that's what i want to say thank you amazing thank you so much Taysuk. that was a great presentation i think the uh examples of Synbio in there were like instant crazy like very innovative and it's a good um, starting point i think here for anyone here that's not too familiar um with Synbio. and i think yeah we can we can hop into some questions and i guess to, to kick start things um and linked to one of the questions that uh, Thomas has put in chat about commercialization um, of the uh, probiotic, it links to serotonin. Um, how would you, yeah, how would you go about commercializing like that technology and in terms of, I guess, the, the diagnostic tool you mentioned with like the color changing poop um, or the, you know, the application of a yogurt as well? Yeah, so that's a great question. So especially the health related medical product, especially using also live cell, there are many, many hurdles. 
I mean, first of all, of course, the technological hurdles. That is, for example, I can I can tell you. So, your gut environment is not like lab environment, constantly changing. No, you you have the flask and then add your bacteria, shake homogeneous. You may have the control. You can kind of control gene expression very easily. But now I'm talking about fluctuating gut environment and food coming goes and then temperature is constant almost but you know environment is completely changing also those probiotics should compete with other bacteria in the gut so those kind of things we need to consider that's why we use mouse model to see whether that is working or not for the kill switch one but we haven't tested our sensor because one thing we need to solve to implement is how fast, how quickly your sensor responds to those chemical level. If the response time is something like one hour or two hour, at the time your chemical level may be different. Right now, then the one hour or so or two hours or so goal. So that means that's not relevant. You may develop just tool for diagnostic tools, just seeing your food color. That might be easier because permanent, permanent memory circuit you could implement with the fluctuating concentration, and then you could kind of monitor that one in some way. But still, you know, that response time is very important because, you know, as you can imagine, constantly changing. And so those kind of question you need to ask. That's why I believe probiotic project is much longer term. But another even bigger problem is the regulation and approval process. At the end of the day, you need to convince FDA to approve the pro product. And at the same time, you need to consider biocontainment because this is GMO, so-called GMO. But I'm very optimistic because one company I know because I gave a talk over there and then I know all the founder over there called Synergic. They already started, I believe, the phase three clinical trial using one enzyme that degrade amino acid, phenylalanine, and unfortunately accumulation of phenylalanine for some patient lead to sometimes even death. Unfortunate fact is the mostly affecting the newborn baby. And the only solution for them is the diet restriction. But they basically use the probiotic that has the enzyme that degrade phenylalanine. And then their data is very promising up to phase two. And then I hope they will succeed the final step of the approval process, but entire process takes roughly one, 10 years, something like that. So that is kind of one hurdle. So if you are thinking about probiotic project or live cell therapy and so on, you should have the clear technology and promising technology. At the same time, you need to understand the long process of approval. So that's the two challenges I can think of. Yeah, that answer your question? Oh, yeah, no, that, that was amazing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, sorry to hear that there's a few different roadblocks, but hopefully you'll be able to, um, smash through those, uh, in the near future. And I guess it kind of leads me on to another question, um, which is, you know, what, what kind of other struggles are there? Do you think you have as, as a researcher in this field? What kind of struggle I have? Mm, and you mentioned at the beginning of, as well about um, I think there was a paper in in Nature or Science uh, one of the two about the um, reduction in innovation and disruptiveness in science as well and maybe oh, that I links see. into it as well maybe yeah let me put this way so what I feel right now is all the university not all of course the some university and many of them actually, unfortunately, they becoming a profit organization. By that, I mean, university 
care about money, of course, care about reputation. And reputation or money sort of proportional to how many paper coming out of the professor, how many, you know, high profile paper coming out in short term. Because all the funding support three to five years. And then out of that time frame, they should have some product. Because of the culture, university sort of indirectly nurture short term project with the incremental advances in science and technology. I didn't like that culture at all because sometimes one big technological advance change completely. I'll give some example. Internet, you know, a long time ago developed with the DAPAR support. And then that basically changed the entire world. At the time, people probably would not think the world we currently living in, but that is disruptive technology. Right now, I'm seeing AI, you know, you also heard about or even use chat GPT that may also disrupt the future technology or our life. I'm talking about those kind of technology, but unfortunately right now, we see decrease in those kind of technology development. But I'm also optimistic because one example we recently saw that is a CRISPR technology. There are lots of different problem, including ethics problem, safety problem, and, and so on. But if we wisely use that technology, I believe that technology will disrupt, already disrupting our life in some sense. But that requires lots of discussion between stakeholders, also public and scientists, to make that technology safely used. And that is something I wanted to mention. Yeah, no, amazing. Uh, again, it's uh, it's obviously it's unfortunate to hear um, what you were saying about like university cultures and things, but hopefully that's something that we can begin to shift around in the near future. And um, I would say in terms of the um, the disruptiveness that you were mentioning as well, I think, uh, yeah, hopefully that will be something that, that changes for us in the future as well as, yeah, stakeholders and things are able to have these conversations. And um, I think, yeah, keeping like biosecurity in mind is definitely a pressing issue. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, especially with SimBio as well, the potential for engineered pandemics, amongst other things, is obviously a, a big risk, an existential one even. So, yeah, very important matters to be discussed. But um, I guess thinking about time as well, I, I have plenty of questions I'd love to ask, but um, I want to make sure that the audience gets some some value out of this uh, talk for themselves. So if there's any questions, then please, please feel free to raise your hand. You can type them in chat as well. It's completely up to you, but we'd love to hear from everyone. So what, one more thing I want to add is the change in culture is very, very difficult or very challenging. I tried to change the culture for the last two years, but I couldn't do so. But I'm still optimistic. The reason is I'm seeing lots of young people passionate about solving global problems. And for example, I last year I traveled more than 160 days to give seminars and conference talk. What I found is promises. That is basically from the young people, the passionate young people try to solve the problems and global problems, including climate, of course, the sustainability, medicine, and so on. Although they facing, they have been facing all the difficult problems, including COVID even some discrimination or war in Ukraine, earthquake in Turkey, something we don't want to see, but we saw 
for last three years or longer. But from that excitement and passion, I now conclude we will able to change our culture because at the end of the day, you guys, young people, will be our future readers. We depend on you because you will solve all the problems. So my conclusion is basically, I may continue my research next 20 years with the multiple diploma project, but I don't believe I will solve all the problems myself because I have too many interests in too many different directions. But if I inspire or nurture these young people, that's why I'm here today. If I inspire 100 people or 1,000 people by just giving one seminar or just talking to one person, 1,000 people will inspire other people and you guys will solve 1,000 different problems. And that's how we change the culture and that's how we make the this world much better place. And then I will benefit from that. When I was older, my daughter will live in much better place I wanted to make. So that's why I'm passionate about interacting with young people. And you are because you are the future leader. Amazing. Thank you very much for those words. I think that was, that was very, very inspiring. And we're glad that we can give you, you know, these kind of spaces to have these conversations to reach this kind of audience. And, and hopefully after this, we'll be able to publish this, uh, this recording so that it will reach even, even more people. Um, yeah, great. Amazing. Um, but yeah, any, any other questions uh, for Taisuk while he's, while he's here? Any question? Don't be shy. No, you could, you could ask career advice, anything. And then I now start to see the chat. Yes, I'm I'm commercializing my thing by actually I need to show one more slide that is about my conflict of interest slide. That is actually I'm actually forming a company. And the name is Moonshot Bio. Why not? My last name is Moon. Moonshot is something crazy. And so we will start a company and then you know. I will solve two problems. Basically, one is the plastic problem, the other is a probiotic problem. Yes, I didn't answer that part. Yeah, I'm doing that already. Amazing. Yeah, if there's any uh, links and things to to the different resources you've mentioned as well, do send them across, and we can we can get those sent out. Yeah. Also, I'm seeing another question from Thomas. Uh, you know, consider working with the Pivot Bio. Yes, Pivot Bio founder is my friend. You know. Karsten and Arvin is my friend from my postdoctoral work. And let me give you a you know, few ideas. So natural fixation is fantastic. They start the company. And now I feel like, okay, all my friend, and you know, even Ginkgo Bio work, the all the founder is my friend. I mean, we regularly met every week, you know, once or every week when we are graduate student at MIT. Now I realize all the genius friend or smartest friend I had start a company and become CEO, entrepreneur, whatever. All the dumbest people like me start a professor job because we don't have any skill set regarding finance. We only know how to teach. We only know how to do research but we don't know how to gather money, how to pitch, how to manage money. And so we don't know. So all the genius friends start a company, but I'm, I love my job because my impact is different. But this young people impact on my friend, their impact is basically doing real thing, product, and then make impact in the society. So yes, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, I, you know, I'm happy to use, and actually I'm using the natural fixing bacteria myself, using photosynthetic bacteria. That's another project I started 10 years ago and continue to do so. Hey, I've got one question if I can. Sure. Um, 
Yeah. So you mentioned about the kind of decline of, of disruptive innovations. And I think it's something that's been on a lot of people's minds lately um, mm -hmm. in terms of the science and, and maybe how we actually conduct ourselves as scientists, how we collaborate with each other. What, what are your kind of what's your take on how we could improve that process and be more disruptive as a as a collective society? That's a great question. So let me let me give my perspective. So you know, not necessarily always disruptive technology is good if our technology level is already high enough. There is no improvement required, right? So some fear, I guess, they don't need disruptive technology. However, we, I never thought about the world I currently live in when I was middle school student, because at the time we don't have internet, right? But now our life is complete change. So disruption or creativity coming from a society that allow freedom of speech or enhancing or nurturing diversity. That should be done first. Otherwise, some idea from some outliers, they cannot express because the return, if you express those crazy idea, the return or response will be harsh criticism. In that environment, we cannot do disruptive thing, but unfortunately last decade, we kind of facing those things. That's the reason I fomented one idea for 10 years because I didn't have the courage or gut to express the crazy idea. But now I actually did that because I don't care what other people are talking about because I also established but you guys, young people, you probably worry about other people's opinion because you are not as established people, right? But this is all adult fault because we need to nurture that culture. But unfortunately, we didn't. So what I want to do is I want to change the culture if I have power. So I'm currently doing so, but I also face lots of obstacles and barriers because those people do not want to change. But you can change the culture. You should. And then we need to start right now. I'm not sure that answer your question or not, but that is the my No, that's a, a great answer. And I think that kind of is the reason, you know, we as Valley Dow are really trying to change the culture and it, it really right. supports that message. I think is something that we're well poised to be able to do being you know a part of the younger generations um and i guess that points to to diana's question in the chat which maybe you might want to answer as well okay so the question is uh as a final year undergraduate i'm currently debating the phd route versus getting work experience in industry and working my way up that way then eventually going into a PhD. Do you have any advice? Okay, that's a fantastic question. So I can give direct answer to that because I did the same thing. So give me, give you some idea. I train as a applied chemist. And then at that time, you know, even high school student, I didn't take any advanced biology course except one basic biology, and that's it. But somehow in my college years, I start to love biology. And then I took some microbiology course in outside of my department. And then I start my biochemical engineering master degree. And then I realized I'm an engineer. So I need to work for the company and that's my decision. And then I work for company for five and a half years. And that experience was amazing because I had all the experts in the research part because I was 
researcher in that research park, but that's the company. You know, the company name is LG. You know, you remember LG as phone company or TV company, but LG is a huge company with the chemical division and biotech division. I work for the biotech division. And then luckily I promoted very quickly to manager position. And then I start to supervise more you know, employee as a manager. And that means I interact more people with more people. And then I start to realize, oh, I love to interact with people, love to mentor. So I go back to academia as a PhD student. So I was experienced, but one problem, embarrassing problem I, I could share with you. All my classmates at MIT when I was a graduate student, literally eight years younger than me. And some of that even 10 years younger than me because some smart kid at MIT literally skipped some grade. So I was all this in the classroom. Right now, my English improved, but at that time, I have no idea what professor talking about in entire one hour. I record the lecture and listen to again, but I still do not understand what, I'll talk, what they are talking about. So my first year of graduate life was oh. poor. Oh, somebody wanted to say something? No, no, but my point here is that semester was so difficult for me because even my wife pregnant and then we have the sleep this night while preparing for my qualifying exam and so on. But what I wanted to say is you are young. Any path you choose, that is okay. Young people worry about too much. I used to worry about too much. Everything, every decision we worry about. When I was young, every single thing, everything we worry about. What would be future? If I decide this way, what would be future? My advice to anybody, any young people, do it. And then fail miserably when you are young. I'm not talking about you intentionally fail, but I failed miserably when I was high school student because you know, I was okay in middle school, but I didn't study much because I hanging out with my friend until eight o'clock evening to play soccer. No, football, real football, not American football. And then I, my grade, my academic performance in high school was horrible and then promised my ranking. And then I start to study, but I saw, I experienced from that failure, I learned many things. If I fail right now, I'm almost 50 years old, it will be 10 times more difficult than you guys in terms of recovery. But if we are young, if we are in the school especially, if you fail, there is the way to recover. Because good thing about academic environment is failure, you will have the second chance or third chance at the end of the day. So to answer your question, any route will be fine. Industry experience is valuable. Coming back, you will have the only bit more challenge, including for my case, I didn't remember what is the derivative or cosine when I start my, but I, I love mathematics, but I didn't remember what is the derivative or cosine, something like that. I didn't know how to say my MATLAB coding. I was a very good computer program student 30 years ago, 30 years ago. But when I start at MIT, MATLAB, I have no idea what MATLAB is. I don't know how to save my coding, but I pass all everything. 
spend 10 times more time than other students. So that's why I advise for you. Okay, I see another question. Uh, that answer your question? Diana? Hi, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. that was great advice, thank you so much. Uh, actually, I have a sure. follow-up question. Um, so I guess the challenge then comes that, you know, if you're trying to get into industry after undergrad, you don't have much experience. So I guess like now industries are putting the bar higher and higher, you know, they require masters, uh, PhD, other experience. So how do you start when you have very little experience? So let, let me let me give my perspective. So this is already not relevant because I'm talking about more than 20 years ago. At that time I got my master degree and I'm joined the company. But the our current education system, unfortunately, uh already there are some gap between industry job and uh, education right now because current education is you know more focused on advanced technology and so on, but still many industry require or some traditional training. But you know you don't need to worry about too much because they will retrain you in the company. But the your question like more likely how to get the job. Am I right? Yeah. So how do you kind of break into that um, into the industry. So how to get a job is, you know, your sorry, uh, just quickly, uh, oh. Tessuk, uh, we're we're coming up on on um, six p.m. where I am, uh, but the hour mark. I'm not sure if you have another commitment, but we're happy to stay and carry on these conversations if you are. I just wanted to make you uh, aware. Let me check my calendar. I probably do not have anything except lunch time, and then I'll have another meeting probably one hour later. So I can I can shorten my lunch time, so that's fine. So to answer your question. Your GPA is set if you are senior or junior, and you cannot change that part. And your application, your CV, probably you don't have much time to improve. In that case, the only thing you could think about is how to make connection with people. What I meant by that is, as you can imagine, there are too many applicants for a single job, right? And then we are human. We are not AI. You know, if AI hire, and then if you AI review application, AI probably pick one person all the time out of 10 different, you know, trial. But we are human. If I know you, Diana, and then I wanted to hire somebody, and then if I don't know, I'm sorry, Lisa, uh, you didn't speak up, so I don't know Lisa, I probably more biased because I know you somehow beforehand. And then at the end of the day, the, your chance would be higher if your qualification and GPA and everything similar to Lisa, and then you may get the job. So in that case, the question is how to make the, that connection. I mean, you, one way I could recommend is you probably use some social media. I actually start my social media very actively, not before, but starting 2021. And one great format is the LinkedIn. You could randomly you could kind of sign up that one and then you two, you could kind of build up your network or you could ask your professor kind of, you know, recommend some people or industry. You could also attend some career fair. And those things, you know, something I wanted to recommend because we are human and then human interaction is sometimes more important than our CV or resume. That, that makes a lot, a lot. Yeah, sure. definitely. That makes a lot of sense. And it's very good advice. Like it's very tangible advice. Thank you. Okay. I also see Thomas ask another question. How important do you think location is when it comes to building a career in but okay? 
location means you're talking about building a company. It, it should be San Francisco, Boston, Chicago, that question, right? It, I mean, building a company is a good question, but I was just talking about uh, as an employee or as a, uh, a researcher in this. But... Oh, I see. Location is important, of course. You know, for example, my daughter loves winter, cold weather. She should be somewhere cold weather. Me, I'm not that person, you know, love cold weather, so I should be in the warm weather. Because you are talking about job but why you wanted to get a job because you want to be happy so your daily life also should be happy so i mean if you have the choice i mean if we don't have a choice i mean that's not another question but if you have the choice i would choose some place you will enjoy but you know in reality you know many Limit, very limited people has that luxury, unfortunately. So, yeah. So, so I mean, that is my the honest answer to that question. Also, actionable advice. So, thank you. Amazing. Any um, yeah. Any any other questions, guys? So, I mean, if you are shy, you could always reach out to me by sending email to my Gmail. My Gmail is probably available in many social media. So just send me email and I'm happy to have separate chat using one-to-one -one Zoom. As I said, I'm traveling a lot. However, I already, last year, for example, I if somebody contact me saying, I want to talk with you. I, I even scheduled a meeting. My local time was midnight or 2 a.m. I only sleep four to five hours a day, so I have plenty of time. So don't be shy because what I'm doing is helping you and then you make the better world. And then I want my daughter living in that better world. So that's what I want to do. So you helping me basically at the end of the day. Amazing, Any amazing. Um, yeah, if, if there's no other questions, guys, uh, thank you all so much for showing up. And Taysuk, thank you so much for your time. It has been an absolute pleasure um, getting to meet you and getting like into your work and hearing a bit about what you have to say as well. Amazing. I think it'd be amazing to have a, another conversation with all these different things you spoke about. I don't think we had a comprehensive chat, but um, yeah, we'll definitely hopefully keep this this relationship going. I think it will be very, very promising. And um, we'd love to help you fulfill sure. your mission uh, of yeah, changing the culture, setting trends. We, we'd love to be a part of that. So um, again, sure. yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for coming, everyone. Um, and sure. yeah, we'll, we'll have a hopefully, yeah, this spotlight series will, will continue. Um, so we'll have some some more guests as well. So yeah, please be sure to to join along. But yeah. Have a lovely evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are in the world. Yeah, thanks a lot, everyone.